So what you've just heard from Alana are the, are the kind of two complementary perspectives that we're hoping that all of you begin to think about as you're formulating questions for the, for the, for the audience piece of tonight's event. So you've seen some of the language teaching, some of the criticality, um, and the language policy piece in the first 15 minutes. So now it is my pleasure to introduce David Malinowski, who I would humbly say, when you begin to think about language teaching and learning with the linguistic landscape, the first person that would come to mind from that perspective would be David. And so we are privileged not only to have a pioneer in linguistic landscape and language policy and testing and evaluation, but also one of the or the uh, individual who has really begun to take the look at what it is we do, as Alana was talking about, with the linguistic landscape so that we break down those borders with the classroom and begin to think about linguistic landscape as uh, a context or opening up spaces, as David talks about, for language, linguistics, literary, and cultural studies. Uh, he is the uh, research specialist at the uh, Yale Center for Language Studies, and we are privileged to have him with us. So I'm going to give him a big round of applause for David. And uh, also a lecturer in Korean language. Oh my God. Oh, thank you. Lee. Yeah. Thank you, Lee. Uh, wow. Uh, I'm so flattered. I, I don't know <laughs> what to say, really. Uh, but um, I think that linguistic landscape is a very small field, and language teaching and learning, of course, is, is quite huge. But when you put the two together, there might just be a few people who are doing that. So it's <laughs> um, but it's such an honor to be here and to be speaking to you also. So many of my friends and peers and colleagues also um, from Yale and, and schools around in the area. And, and I've been to a couple of the consortium meetings in the past, so I really want to say thank you to Elsa and to everybody from the consortium. It's just a pleasure to be here. Um, very similarly to a couple of years ago when we, when we talked about content-based instruction, there was this big, you know, this, this keyword, linguistic landscape, content-based instruction, and a lot of discussion and theorizing, head-scratching went into it, and then finally the question came up uh, during the discussion, but per Ulab, uh, what is content? <laughs> <laughs> oh God, you know, <laughs> please don't ask. We hope to have a chance, you know, Elana had her chance and I have mine a little bit to say sort of what is linguistic landscape and how is it useful for language teaching and learning, um, but it's just very much in the beginning. So thank you to the consortium, thank you to the LRC here at Columbia and Lee, all of your work. So much really interesting, neat work is being done starting from uh, before maybe even the Reading the City uh, 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 symposium that happened last year, bringing together the humanistic and social sciences in dialogue with language teaching through these questions of Space, spatial practices and language use and so on. So it's a very exciting place to be right now here. Lee, thank you. And, and I also wanted to say thank you to my own language center, the Center for Language Study, because I am a, not just a research uh, a, a person, but a, a technology research was where I came to the, the language center for and for uh, me to get support from the language center to think about how learning is happening outside of the classroom with technological tools some of the time for sure, but also through our eyes, ears, our touch, our walking, the enunciation that we make as we move through space also as a kind of technology, I think requires a very liberal vision and I'm very thankful to have time to pursue this, this pursuit as well. Um, so here is, is the same topic as Alana uh, covered here as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about the what of linguistic landscape. What is linguistic landscape? How does it relate to language teaching and learning? Uh, I think I'm... Uh, uh, just a little bit about the how. Uh, a lot of that is going to happen tomorrow in the workshops, actually getting our hands a little bit dirty as we walk through the city before, uh, and beforehand in, the, um, in the, uh, the whole morning sessions when we work together to think about pedagogical practice. But uh, a large part of what I'm going to say too is the why and what I got from Alana too is part of the excitement and not just the not just, uh, uh, excitement of using new cameras and going outside and taking pictures because... <laughs> One thing that's, I think, very important to think about with respect to linguistic landscape, as, as Alana said earlier, is that it's not just about another place to find authentic language use. That's not why we would want to think about using uh, or, or, or engaging with the linguistic landscape, but we are, once we leave the classroom and even beforehand, perhaps, 
responsible to ourselves, to our peers, to our neighbors, to the people on the bus, to the people who live with us in the same city in these, these very diverse uh, spaces where political and social issues are being uh, practiced, they're being contested right, right next to us and right through our own actions. The world doesn't look like this anymore. It never did, maybe. But uh, this is one uh, starting point of, of, of linguistic landscape. They're the whole ideology that still lives in a lot of our textbooks that say nation states are colored in one uniform color. They're spoken by uh, a certain number of people and certain languages are attached to certain places with certain caveats. Uh, it is not any longer a kind of worldview that works for us. As uh, Suresh Kanagaraja talks about the multilateral flow of people, things, and ideas across borders has made more visible mixed forms of community and language in highly diversified geographical spaces. Walk outside the, the room here uh, in the building down uh, Amsterdam Avenue, and you'll hear and see so many different languages being spoken as they are in this room. Uh, super diversity is one of the key words that uh, Jan Blomer has used quite a bit, but it goes back to Vertovic in, in uh, 2007. And this is a key word, I think, for thinking about the nature of the society and the, the language uh, that we are uh, teaching w to our students, uh, not just one language, but languages in contact with each other uh, through everyday encounters with all kinds of varieties, accents, uh, different languages, and so on. That, Again, a one language perspective is not enough. Um, Actful tells us that we should be thinking about not just communication, cultures, com uh, connections, and comparisons, but also communities. Students, uh, the description goes for the, uh, the standard. Uh, community standards use the language both within and beyond the school setting. Well, there's a little problem with it, and if you've been to uh, some of the um, uh, conferences where this, the national standards have been taking up, I'm kind of curious to know how often you hear the community standard being actually talked about. Um, in fact, a, uh, folks at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and some of their colleagues have talked about the community standard as the lost sea one that is often mentioned, but very little knowledge actually exists about what to do about it. And uh, they did a very, Sally Magnin and, and others did an interesting study uh, in foreign language journals, and it's 2012, you can't see the date. But when they said the, the most striking and troublesome feature emerging from a, a comparison of uh, a little comparison that they had uh, the, the teachers of language rank the five standards uh, according to which one is the most important for them, and students rank the standards according to which ones are most important for them in accordance with their own goals for learning the language, they found that the students rank communities number one. <laughs> Teachers rank them the last, and which was kind of interesting, and they say very problematic. What do we do about this as language teachers? Going back to, way back to the previous millennium when a, uh, a group in new literacy studies, uh, the New London group, put out a, uh, another kind of uh, paradigmatic kind of doc uh, document that is embodied in another sort of circular design right here. This is, uh, I'm not asking you to read it. I'm, I'm not sure if your vision uh, will allow you <laughs> to focus in on this. But, but what this is, is, uh, is a uh, circle, basically, that shows the different kind of design elements in meaning making, designed to try to get literacy and language teachers like ourselves to think beyond just the linguistic as spoken and written language, but to think about communication in a much broader multimodal sense. So of course linguistic design, creating meanings as design, is part of that, but visual design, how meanings are expressed through uh, their visual representation is an important part of that, and we have to focus on that too, they say as well as audio design, the way that sound carries meaning in non-linguistic ways, in conjunction with, that's gestural behind the microphones there if you can't see it, so I'll point to it and, show, and tell you. Um, and the last one on their list, and the one with the fewest bullet points as well, is spatial design. Hmm, something might be going on here, but spatial design, uh, if you zoom in on it, uh, says that in our language and literacy classrooms, we also want to be teaching learners how to use their communication skills in order to understand and create meanings that have to do with ecosystems and geographies, the, the meanings that are embedded in and uh, revealed through architectural design and movement through space and these kind of things. 
scratch my head, it's pretty abstract. How am I doing this in my classroom? I don't know. But our, uh, our imperative is to think about, I would say, how to do these things. And so this, these kind of uh, views, the community standard on one hand and the spatial design uh, of imperative from the New London group on the other, I think, ask us to think about language not as a uniform uh, a homogenous kind of abstraction that exists in our black boxes inside of our minds, but rather as something that is practiced, and it's practiced newly and uh, uniquely every time it is spoken, every time a word is spoken, uh, here and now, and it is correlated absolutely with the place of enunciation, where it is spoken, how it is embodied, as Alistair Pennycook talks about with, uh, with his work about language as a local practice. And similarly, Kevin Leander uh, uh, and colleagues have also talked about spatial literacies as something that we ought to be thinking about uh, as language educators as well, that we create, learners create, space time uniquely. Space is not like an empty vessel that everything fits into, but is something that is created through our movements, our actions, and our speech, our walking uh, verbally and physically through space. So maybe we have to think together here, and I hope we do uh, today and tomorrow, about how to bring these things together productively in our own classrooms. Well, linguistic landscape. That's uh, <laughs> This is the key word and one of the key words uh, that, that we've been uh, looking at here. Certainly not the only solution, but maybe one. So in some sense, I'd like to ask us to look at some of these images for what they are literally, but also for how they behave metaphorically. Language, when it's spoken anytime, tells you somehow where you are. You are addressed by language. You are called into being by being addressed in language. And the signs on the street do that literally, but uh, the words that we speak, of course, are also signs. So I'm thinking about signs in, in two different ways, one more uh, literal and abstract. This is on the corner of uh, a very popular street uh, in New Haven. Yeah, there are popular streets in New Haven. It uh, <laughs> tells you where, where you are. Uh, it says, well, you have to go this way for the Yale Art Gallery, that way for the Visitor Center, this way to get to the State Street uh, train station, and so on. So in some sense, it tells you where we are, where to go. And the flip side, of course, of seeing where that is, is that you know that you stand here. Right? There is a relationship that's going on there. But it's also telling you something that's more of an ideological thing as well, a very subtle. Walk New Haven, it says. Is that a name, uh, a, a, sort of an uh, abstract name of a campaign? Or is it actually instructing you what to do and how to live? Don't drive your car, don't ride your motorcycle, walk New Haven. Uh, and what kind of a city this is going to be. Signs tell us not only just what is and what isn't, what things are called in some abstract sense, but they tell us where we belong or where we don't. If you've been in the neighborhood with this neighborhood sign, you know, do you feel welcomed by it or do you feel excluded? Or do you feel both at the same time? The eye, is it your eye looking at other suspicious people in your neighborhood? <laughs> or are you one of the suspicious people who feel like you're being looked at and uh, made to feel uh, uncomfortable here? Ideologies, we think right now, they're so subtle, they don't really exist that much in language. It wasn't like the old days in 1920s in my liberal progressive state of California, near Hollywood. Uh, this is from the 1920s in Hollywood, actually, um, right around the time of uh, a lot of racist exclusionist policies that were being enacted uh, by the United States as a whole. This kind of uh, overt racism and uh, sexism and other kinds of ideologies, maybe they're a little hard to see when you live with them every day, but actually the language is, the landscape is changing. It's not static. It is something that is under constant change. And if you walk around the Yale campus these days, you'll see some very interesting changes that are happening. The word master is disappearing from all the buildings. The word uh, master uh, of residential colleges has been uh, decided by uh, the Yale administration that we're going to replace this word with the head of colleges because of the connotations that the word master has for many students in the context of uh, all kinds of, of, of racist incidents on, and across the whole country. The uh, very name Calhoun College has come under a lot, of, uh, a lot of debate recently, and that college name, we don't know what's going to become of it in the coming months and years. It might disappear, it might change. Contestation and change is visible right there on the bathroom door. 
in Yale, where the movement to uh, make bathroom segregation and inclusion uh, more transparent has, is very much underway, and all gender restrooms are, are on the increase in campus, on campus, and how to label them. And should we still use those silly little icon figures that, that indicate men and women? Should we put a skirt on one side and a leg on the other side? Should we, what should we do? You can see these battles going on all the time, right? It's being fought over, and it's not like it's just reflecting something, some debate that's happening somewhere else. The linguistic landscape is where the debate is happening to a large degree. And so that is really exciting. Of course, it's not just reflecting what exists somewhere else. I would say that we, and especially language learners, because we're so actively engaged as learners and teachers in the languaging of the world, are actually writing these texts even as we're reading them in some ways. If you speak German, uh, German this was actually uh, uh, from a trip to Germany earlier this year, you might guess what word appears below this bicycle uh, on this sign right here. And I wonder if we have any experts who'd like to guess. Or no already. The sign is saying, I think, bikes, don't, bikes aren't allowed on that uh, street. So what German word would go in that blank? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry? Verboten. Mm, well, maybe very, very correct, but uh, it doesn't appear here. <laughs> Any other guess? Huh? Ah, no, no. Okay, the drum roll, please. Oh. Bicycle free. Wow. Yeah, bicycle free. Now, is, am I correct, uh, German speakers, in reading that as bicycle free, as, as in saying that bicycles are not allowed on this street? No, no I'm not. <laughs> How would I interpret this? That bicycles are. Oh, that they are. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. I was a novice German. Bicycles. See, you know. <laughs> Everyone here thought they were coming to learn things. Actually, it's the other way. I, I just want to use it for them. Um, right. So what would it be like to see bicycle free on, on uh, signs here in the U.S.? Well, it would look kind of funny. It's not how we would say things or do things. So across cultures and across languages, there is a translation going on as we navigate these spaces. Here's another one. This is a real, uh, real sign that I've taken the liberty of wiping out uh, a little bit of Spanish from. Uh, here, please take notice on a bank, about two minutes walk from my workspace. Outside, please take notice, no loitering. And so for all of the folks who, who speak some Spanish in here, how would we say no loitering? You expect maybe a direct translation between the two, right? No loitering. I mean, it's two words. How hard could it be, right? <laughs> a really long, well, <laughs> so if you're wondering what, what a lot of fit folks would do, they would, the first thing you do, of course, when you're faced with a problem like this, is you Google Translate it, right? So uh, I went on to Google, speaking of technology, and I translated this with Google Translate, and I got, oh, sin merodear. And I've actually learned that, uh, well, so merodear, this is a verb, and it's uh, passing by, is it right, sort of, loitering? Does it actually give the same sense, or is it different? Ambling. No ambling. <laughs> That's, <laughs> or, see, it's, uh, it's horrible when I do that with English, right? Because you just, I just corrupted Mero de Ar as well, so. But it's also the police take notice is a bit strange in English. Yeah. Yes, it is, yeah. right? So, so in fact, whoever translated the sign for the bank that's here uh, in this street on, on Church Street in New Haven chose something different. They chose this. No se permite vagabundos. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow, I'm not a very proficient speaker of Spanish, but somehow vagabundos makes me think of vagabonds. Um, and where an action is prohibited on the left side, a person is prohibited on the right. And, oh wow, I find that to be so interesting. Here's a, here's a tip of an iceberg that I'd like to go down and explore a little bit more. So this uncertainty that we have about what the, what's actually going to be written there, the, the ability to question what is being written as natural, 
uh, is especially highlighted, I think, when you start juxtaposing languages to each other and thinking about how do we write our spaces? How do we, as language teachers and learners, help our students to interpret and translate spaces? Linguistic landscape, I won't go through in, in much detail because I'm already uh, over time as well, and I really want to just uh, uh, stop very quickly here, but I wanted to mention uh, here's a definition, a paradigmatic definition of what linguistic landscape is. This is probably the most quoted quote of all linguistic landscape studies, and these days almost no one likes it anymore because linguistic <laughs> landscape is not just about the pieces of metal that have words written on them that are bolted to the sidewalk or the, the buildings and so on. These days, the definitions are evolving quite a bit. We're not so much thinking about the objects, but the practices and how meanings are made. Uh, and how the human <laughs> body and the human subjectivity and everything are and communicative practices are imbricated in meanings that are made in public space. However, we still do take a lot of photographs and we still are very interested in what signs say. Um, so these, this sense here, if you haven't already got that sense already from what I and Alana have been saying so far, is that we're not interested in just the linguistic landscape as a reflection of, of society or so on, but even Landry and Boris said that it is an independent variable. Linguistic landscape creates its own meaning and influences society on its own as well, signaling who is uh, uh, prominence uh, in society, what their position is in society, who is visible, who's not visible, and that this is an intensely political and ideological realm that we want our students to get more involved with. Um, so. I want to move forward here. You'll find uh, a number of publications we can talk more about that are there, but uh, Linguistic Land Landscape Journal, I think, is one that, that ought to be mentioned. It's very exciting. A lot of great work is being done there, and I, I encourage you to, to get it and to encourage Columbia's library to subscribe if it's not already. Um, <laughs> There are a lot of people who are doing work uh, in linguistic landscape, a number of them in different kinds of language and literacy teaching and learning situations. So here are some names uh, that, uh, of those who are doing things. It's certainly not just one person. There are lots and lots of folks who are starting to be interested in this. Um, so that's, that's a few names to, to look at. Uh, there are also, you know, they're talking about all the different kinds of things you can do. We'll work on this in, uh, tomorrow as well. What kinds of activities can you do as a teacher with your students out uh, in the linguistic landscape or have them do as well? Here are some activities, many of which I think many of you have tried uh, with different name, under a different name, right? The linguistic landscape is sort of the catchphrase as well. But a lot of you have been working with environmental print or photo tours or, or walking tours and so on uh, before. Uh, for various kinds of competencies. Uh, so there's not one approach that we would advocate. There's not one way to do it or anything that I think that it opens up a new window on a number of diverse ways of, of uh, practicing, uh, teaching and learning, and of uh, braiding together a lot of the approaches that a lot of you are already using and thinking about. For instance, uh, project-based learning. If you look at the traits here that uh, the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii has put out. They have six tenets of project-based learning. You can imagine how so many that these sorts of tenets for projects would work very, very well for activities that are taking place outside uh, in the linguistic landscape. And similarly, service learning and community-based learning, uh, the, the Michael Byram and, and colleagues uh, sort of uh, view of intercultural communicative competence. Uh, where they're using ethnographic methods and research methods from other disciplines in order to help language learners become more reflective uh, learners and to do things like interview and, and systematically observe and take notes of, of sociological phenomena that are in place around them are very applicable here too. Um, so I, I think there are very many uh, different things that you're already doing that we could start reframe and think of in a new way. Technology, we've, we've, it's in the title. I thought it's important to just to uh, show a few things. This is my start in 2005. I was at UC Berkeley and worked with the Korean program there to do a, uh, an online forum. But many of you are probably far away from communities where the language that you teach is actually spoken or visible in public spaces. But uh, here was a project where students uh, did a telecollaboration of sorts and, uh, and posted pictures one class of students from Suwon University south of Seoul and another class of Korean learners at UC Berkeley posting pictures from their own environments and what looked natural to the students in their own environments 
were very odd to the students somewhere else. And this one here is one of my favorite signs of all times that says in Korean on the top, let's love the trees. And then <laughs> below it, keep off. Um, similarly, Korean learners were very, very curious as to why uh, Berkeley seemed to want to give away free drugs because they had drug-free zone everywhere. I know. <laughs> We, we read about this, but is it true? And the, No, no, no. So these kinds of icebergs were uh, sort of explored through these forums in that sense. But even right now at Yale, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Candace Skarupa, is doing a telecollaboration. She's a French instructor. She has her intermediate French class uh, get online once a week in the spring with uh, Paris Telecom, uh, uh, the Telecom Paris Tech uh, students. And they are taking each other for virtual walks using Google Street View. Um, on Skype, and so they're not actually sharing screens, they're uh, both logged in simultaneously, and they're having to language what they're seeing and how they're moving through space, showing each other their favorite places, all of these different kinds of things. Here's a few things that people are doing, uh, what people are doing with technology, but we shouldn't always trust technology. <laughs> Google Translate. <laughs> you point it point your camera at the sign, and it does translate uh, 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 not too bad. So I think our challenge, one of our challenges here is to think specifically about how we can dive into things that we're already somewhat familiar with, but haven't done justice to, like the community standard and spatial design with respect to multiliteracies, but not lose sight of the bigger picture that they want us to think about, how we can have well-rounded and very uh, comprehensive kind of approach uh, to these specific things we're having our learners do. That's enough uh, from me, and I think uh, we'll stop. <laughs> Thank you.